Please open your Bibles to Matthew 27, beginning in verse 62. It says, now on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I am to rise again. Therefore give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day, otherwise his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go, make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure and along with the guard they set a seal on the stone. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and, other, and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here for he has risen just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and behold he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid, go and take word of my brethren to leave for Galilee and there they will see me. Now, while they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, you are to say, his disciples came by, uh, came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. Now, although this passage announces the glorious resurrection of Jesus according to prophecy and according to his own teaching on the matter. The story is also about the guards at the tomb. It begins with their posting at the burial site and it ends with their being bribed by the, uh, by the, by the um, Jewish uh, uh, officials to keep quiet. Now, if you read too quickly, you, know, you see the resurrection and you know, you're kind of overwhelmed by the, the story of a resurrection, but you miss the involvement in the matter and the incredible response to this great event that took place, not just by the believers, but, the, but, but by the ones who didn't believe. And I'd like to look at those guys, because I think I'm preaching to believers this morning. I'd like to look at the guys who didn't believe. And so, these Roman soldiers, let's just look at them for a second. These Roman soldiers on loan to the Jewish leaders in order to guard Jesus' tomb against looters or fanatic disciples who would you know, try to steal the body. A Roman guard was usually made up of about 12 men. While they were guarding the tomb, they experienced the earthquake and they saw the bright angel roll the stone away and they were deathly frightened to the point where they were immobilized. And once they regained their composure, they went to the city and they reported what they saw to the priests. Now they were on loan to the Jewish authorities and so had to report to, you know, about their mission and the, the fact that their mission had failed and why it had failed. And so they agreed to a cover up when offered money and the priests create a story where Jesus' body is stolen by his disciples while they slept. Now my point in all of this is that these men were aware of the fact that Jesus was dead. These soldiers, they knew he was dead. I mean, they saw the execution. They knew a dead body when they saw one. They actually saw the angel and the rolling away of the stone. They experienced the earth trembling. They saw that the tomb was empty. They knew that no one had come to overpower them. 
No one had come to steal the body. They witnessed the Jewish leaders desperately try to cover up. This they knew, this they did, this they experienced. And yet, with all of these experiences, with all of this evidence, with all of these irrefutable eyewitness events, they still didn't believe. So my question is this morning, just exactly what does it take to believe in the resurrection? Well, one might say, well, these were soldiers, they were hard men, they were killers, they were pagans, what do you expect? Okay, all right, I'll give you that one. But there were others who, in the face of a mountain of evidence, also did not believe. For example, the priests, they didn't believe. In John 11, John describes the miracle where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead after being in the tomb, Lazarus of course, in the tomb for four days. When the priests are told about this from several eyewitnesses, their reaction was to plot to kill both Jesus and Lazarus, even though they acknowledged that Jesus had actually performed this miracle. Think about that. Wait a minute. This guy, Jesus, he just, rose, he just brought somebody back from the dead. How should we react? Well, we better kill this guy. And let's re-kill the guy who he brought out of the grave. Maybe we didn't kill him enough the first time. I mean, what more could one offer these people in order to get them to believe? I mean, the soldiers told them and they ignored the soldiers. Another example, Judas, he didn't believe. In Mark 6, Jesus sends out the 12 apostles to preach and to heal and to cast out demons. We realize that Judas was among the ones doing these things. He also witnessed Jesus' miracles. He heard Jesus' teachings and yet in the end he didn't believe. He even betrayed the Lord. Not enough, you say? Okay, how about the apostles? They didn't believe. You know, lest we be too hard on Judas, we read in both Matthew and Mark that after Jesus' resurrection, there were still some apostles who doubted. Imagine, Jesus has actually risen from the dead and appeared to them, and they're still doubtful. I mean, what does it take? The level of disbelief and hardness of heart displayed despite the evidence, despite the witness, despite the appearances of the risen Christ was incredible when you read about it in these you know, few accounts. If people rejected all of this, my question is why? What does it take to believe in the resurrection of the Christ? What does a person have to have to bring him to the point where he accepts this event as true? After all, if the actual witnessing of it, like the guards and like others, if the actual witnessing of it doesn't automatically do it, then what does exactly? I believe the actual witnessing of the event is a strong element, but for this experience to bring one to belief, there has to be some other factors present without which even witnessing the resurrection is in itself not enough. I mean, think for a moment. Uh, many people witnessed Jesus bringing Lazarus back from the dead, and then their first thought was to kill him because they didn't want him to cause any more trouble. So what does it take to believe? Not just in the resurrection of Lazarus, of course. What does it take to believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Well, first of all, it requires that one believe in God. The Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse six, that he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He, God, is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Now, the resurrection is just something that goes bump in the night. It's just an unexplained phenomenon for those who have no faith in God. For those who have no faith in God, that's just, wow, that's weird. Somebody rose from the dead, wow. Some strange things happening in this world. 
The guards didn't really believe in God to begin with, and I'm not saying they were witnesses of the resurrection, I'm just saying by deduction they could have come to that conclusion. They didn't really believe in God to begin with, and so this event was simply frightening to them. Their response was not faith, it was fear. For the Roman pagan, God was no stronger than the sun or the earth, perhaps as strong as the emperor. But even the emperor could not raise men from the dead. Their gods were too small to do this, and so their reaction was confusion, was fear. You know, they had no frame of reference here. They, they didn't know where to hang this thing. So to believe that supernatural things can happen, like the resurrection, one must believe in a supernatural being that can make things happen. I mean, one look around the heavens and the earth, one examination of the birth and development of a human being reveals to us a creator who gives life and creates it in a way that is beautiful and complex and marvelous to behold. A creator that is beyond human strength and wisdom, a supernatural being. We cannot believe in the resurrection unless we first believe in the one who can make the resurrection happen. That's my point here. The Hebrew writer says that those who believe in God are rewarded. As a matter of fact, he says that their belief in Him is based on the hope that He will reward them for that belief. The reward that comes from searching for the God we know our conscience and our eyes tell us is out there is that He allows us to find Him. That's the reward. I often wonder, you know, what does He mean there in Hebrews? You know, the one who believes in God, you know, God will reward him for that. What will, what will the reward be? Well, you're going to find Him. If you're searching for God, you're going to find Him. That's the reward. And the great gift is that He is out there just like we suspected that He was all along. So in order to believe in the resurrection, we first have to believe in the God who can make resurrection happen. Number two, what, what, what does it take to believe? Well, it requires that we hear the gospel. That's what it requires. The soldiers didn't believe because they were pagans. They had no desire to find or believe in the true God or what He had to say to them. When the event happened, they had no frame of reference, no way to put it into context, and so they simply ran away, frightened. The priests didn't believe the resurrection because when they did hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus, they rejected Him as a troublemaker and a threat to their position. The one that held the key to open the doors of heaven for them, they rejected. They heard, but they didn't understand. They knew the details and even the actual events, but they didn't see how it affected them. They didn't realize the significance of the event. You know, Paul the Apostle says that faith comes from hearing and hearing the words of Christ, Romans 10, 17. I repeat that, some people say, well, how do I get you know, my brother to believe and how do I convince my father to believe or my best friend to believe? Well, you get them to read the word. Some people say, well, how did you ever become a Christian and so on and so forth? And my answer is always the same. Well, one day I decided to start reading the Bible. It works. There was no special course or DVD or anything like that. Those are good things, mind you, but it was just me and the Bible and three-day train trip. I couldn't get off the train for three days. Faith comes from hearing the words of Christ. The word hearing doesn't just mean the, the deciphering of words, but understanding and responding to those words. You know, like your father when he said to you, did you just hear what I said to you? You know what he's talking about, you know, your dad when he said, did you just hear what I said to you? Not just the words, buddy, but do you understand what you know, my words mean to you? That kind of hearing. Without the message of the gospel to explain the significance of Jesus' resurrection, without the gospel to announce that this resurrection proves 
Jesus' divinity, Romans 1 verse 4, that this resurrection proves that He has power over death, Romans 8 11, that this resurrection proves that sin has been destroyed once and for all, Romans 4 25, that this resurrection proves that this is the first of many resurrections, including our own, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20. Notice I, 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 I'm talking about the verses of Scripture. Why? Because this is some kind of a test? No, because that's where I'm getting this information. Without the gospel revealing the significance and power of the resurrection, the witness of it becomes something frightening or threatening to one's normal view of life. Why do you think people don't want to talk about religion or they push it away or they laugh at it or they, you know, they ignore it? Because they know if they let it in, it's going to change them and they don't want to be changed. The priests, the Pharisees, the soldiers had heard the words, but they did not hear them in such a way as to accept them into their hearts so that the resurrection would be a joyful and confirming thing and not a disturbing event to be dealt with or to be scoffed at. And so, what does it take to believe in the resurrection? It requires that we believe in God first and foremost. It requires, and I mean requires, that we actually hear the gospel. Why do you think this congregation put so much effort and money into, into projects and into ministries that you know, get the word out? World Bible School, why do you think it's called World Bible School? You know, it's because it goes all over the world. All over the world people are learning about the Bible. Why do you think we're on the internet with our, with our church website and with Bible talk? Because we want to get the word as far out as possible. Why? Because people will never uh, 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 respond to the resurrection. They'll never believe it and thus save their souls if they don't hear the gospel. And it's our job in our generation in this place to make sure that that gets out of this building. And then one last thing very important thing. In order to believe in the resurrection, we need to have a desire for what is right. John the Apostle said, and this is the judgment that the light has come into this world and men loved the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. John 3 verse 18. People say, you know, why don't people believe? Because they usually like sin better than they like righteousness. Jesus is the epitome of right. Jesus is the center of moral purity, of truth, of goodness and mercy, as well as knowledge and power and comfort. Anyone remotely looking for any of these things earnestly will find Jesus Christ in the process. You don't go looking for the resurrection. Really, you don't go looking for the resurrection. You go looking for God, and when you find Jesus, you find God. The resurrection is simply the proof of that. Praise be to God when somebody says, you know, I don't know what's wrong with this world, or I'm getting tired of this world, or when people say, you know, is this all there is? Is this, is this what it's about? Can we not believe in anything anymore? Our politicians disappoint us and our role quote models disappoint. You know, where is there something? What's this all? What they're really expressing there is, where is God? Where is He? Where is He in my life? That's what they're looking for. The Pharisees and the priests and the soldiers they weren't looking for right or true or pure or good. They were looking for power, pleasure, profit, and they preferred remaining in the darker regions of the world. Even when they recognized that a bright and shining light was very close to them, it only presented a threat to their way of living. They liked the darkness. It's not that they didn't see that there was a light, they just didn't go to the light because they much preferred the darkness. How many times 
Have you shown your child or someone else the easy and safe way to do something only to have them deliberately choose some other solution that you've warned them will not work, but they do it anyways? If you are a parent, if you have raised children, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've told them a hundred times, you know, if you don't do this, you know, daddy did this and daddy tried this when he was younger and he did that and blah, 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 and it caused a lot of problems in his life and I'm telling you, there's nothing there. Don't do it, you know. <laughs> a horse that isn't thirsty will not drink, even if you lead it to the water. People will not believe the resurrection if they do not thirst for the things that the resurrection produces, even if they see it with their own eyes. You know that's true. How many times have people said to you for one reason or another, you know, there's something different about your family or your children, you know, maybe you've raised your children in the Lord, there's something different about them. We see your family, you know, and so on and so forth, and it's like, it's, it's stamped on your forehead. We're Christians, why do you think we're different? Why do you think things are happening the way they are in our family? And yet, they won't buy in. They won't take the step. So here we are on Easter Sunday where the world takes note of the fact that Christians give special attention to an event that took place some 2,000 years ago, the resurrection from the dead of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Newscasters will mention it with a cold, sober expression. Governments or schools will shut down operations to commemorate the day. Advertisers will fill the airwaves with programs and events around the theme, the resurrection or renewal. In other words, we're going to show movies on the resurrection so that we can continue to sell soap on Easter Sunday or cars. And yet I ask you, with all of the hoopla, why does it not change a thing? I mean, if it's all true, if the Son of God rose from the dead 2,000 years ago, as is reported, as is everyone says, why don't, the newscaster, uh, why don't the newscasters reverently bow their heads and thank God? Report it and say, you know, would you join me in a prayer of thanksgiving now? Why don't the nations lay down their arms and accept Jesus as the divine Lord instead of, as it is happening in several countries, using the name of Christ as a reason why they kill other people? Why doesn't the media follow the news of Jesus' resurrection with a call to repent and confess His name and, and be baptized? Why doesn't that happen? Well, because it takes more than a holiday or a special church service to get people to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It even takes more than actually seeing it happen. It requires a basic faith in a God who can accomplish such a thing. It takes the knowledge of Christ and His word and it takes a desire for right. And when these things are in place, a person is able to believe in the resurrection, able to see it uh, as a proof of God's love and forgiveness and an offer of eternal life. And so today we've heard the answer to the question, my answer anyways, to the question, what does it take to believe in the resurrection? And I've preached this lesson on this particular Sunday, not just to answer the question, but for other reasons as well. First of all, I, I wanted us to remember the foundation upon which our faith and our church is built. No matter what our differences, each one of us believes that Jesus rose from the dead and that one day we will do the same. That's why we're here. It's what the communion is about. It's what our hope is about. It's what keeps us going. No matter what, my hope for my life, when I look at my life and when I see the imperfection of my life, it doesn't matter what I do, there's always something spoiled about it. There's always, you know, there's, it's never just right. It makes me nuts. 
Can I just do one good thing with one good purpose, with one good motivation, you know, without there being some sort of spoilage in there? Some sort of pride, some sort of ignorance? I'm here to remind all of us that the only thing we've got going for us is the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. That's it. We got nothing else, brothers and sisters, nothing else. And I wanted to remind you about what we're supposed to be doing the other 51 weeks of the year. People can't know God, people can't hear His gospel, uh, search and see good, unless the church does its work. Jesus spent three years ministering before the resurrection so that there would be some ready to believe when He came. You ever think about it? Why didn't He just come on down, fully human, I mean fully grown up rather, and you know, within a week could have organized thing to die on the cross, resurrect, get this thing over with. Why 36 months? Well, He had to prepare people to believe in the resurrection. People can't believe in the resurrection unless the church does the initial work of preaching and teaching and serving and living pure lives filled with right first. We got to be a light. Many times people don't believe in Jesus' resurrection because they fail to see any evidence of it in our lives. We got to be the light. We have to be the ones that show the light. What do you think people are drawn to? Just a, an abstract concept over here? People are drawn to people. Why? Because they see the life of Christ in those people and they say, you know what? I want what he's got. And then finally, I wanted to give everyone a chance to confess their belief in the resurrection. If you believe that Jesus has risen from the dead, say amen. 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 If you cannot say amen because you don't know the gospel or you haven't obeyed the gospel or you have fallen away from the gospel and Christ, then say amen to the resurrection by coming forward today to guarantee your own resurrection in the future. If you need to respond to the resurrection of Christ today, then we encourage you in one form or another to do that now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.